Jaya Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kopi Janna Vala Bhagiri Vada Dari Madhava Kunja Bihari Kopi Janna Vala Bhagiri Varadari Yashorananda Nabraja Janna Ranjana Yashora Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chade Yamuna Tiravana Chade Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kupi Janna Valabha Giri Vardhari Yashora Nandana Braja Janna Ranjana Yashora Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tiravana Chari Yamuna Tiravana Chari Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Valabha Giri Varadari Kunja Bihari Gopi Janna Valabha Giri Varadari Jam Vishnu Padma Maham Sipati Vajra Gacharya Ashtrakati Shakti Shri Shimad Zwanga Sai Sipati Vedanta Shalai Prabhupada Ki Jai Gantra Ad Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai All glories to the symbol devotees All glories to the symbol devotees All glories to Shri Shri Guru Nchi Gauranga Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Six Kanta Prescribed Duties for Mankind Chapter 17 Mother Parvati Curses Chitra Ketu Text 20 So everybody can please Either for me. Guna Prabhaha Etasmin Kaha Shapaha Kon Vanu Grahaha Ka Swargo Narakaha Ko Va Kim Sukam Dukam Eva Va Guna Pravaha Etasmin Kashapa Kon Vanugraha Kaswargo Nadaka Kova Kim Sukam Dukameva Va Guna Pravaha Etasmin Kashapa Kon Vanugraha 
Kasargo Nadaka Kova Kim Sukam Dukameva Va Guna Prabaha Etas Men Kashapa Konvanugraha Kasargo Nadaka Kova Kim Sukam Dukameva Va Guna Pravahe, in the current of the modes of material nature. Etasmin, this. Kaha, what? Shapaha, a curse. Kaha, what? Nu, indeed. Anugraha, a favor. Kaha, what? Swargaha, elevation to heavenly planets. Narakaha, hell. Kaha, what? Va, or Kim, what? Sukam, happiness. Dukam, distress. Eva, indeed. Va, or. Translation and commentary by Divine Grace. He spoke to Vedanta Swami. This material world resembles the waves of a constantly flowing river. Therefore, what is a curse and what is a favor? What are the heavenly planets and what are the hellish planets? What is actually happiness and what is actually distress? Because the waves flow constantly, none of them has any eternal effect. Purport. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur sings, Miche Mayara Vashe Yache Bishe my dear living entities within this material world, why are you being carried away by the waves of the modes of material nature? Jiva Krishna Das Evishvas Karleta Aradukanai. If the living entity tries to understand that he is an eternal servant of Krishna, there, there will no longer be misery for him. Krishna wants us to give up all other engagements and surrender unto him. If we do so, where will the cause and effect of this material world be? There's nothing like cause and effect for the surrendered soul. Srila Vishnath Chakravati Thakur says in this regard that being put into the material world, in this material world, is like being thrown into a mine of salt. Has anybody ever been thrown into a mine of salt? If one falls into a mine of salt, he tastes only salt wherever he goes. Similarly, this material world is full of miseries. The so-called temporary happiness of this world is also misery. But in ignorance, we cannot understand this. That is the actual position. When one comes to his senses, when he becomes Krishna conscious, he is no longer concerned with the various conditions of this material world. He is not concerned with happiness or distress curses or favors, or heavenly or hellish planets. He sees no distinction between them. Uh, 
Amikenit vidam dasya kananjana shvakaya chakshivan vidam mena tasmaya shi gurve namaha makam karitivacha am pangam langay tegirim yakripa tamaham vande shi gurundini tadana vancha kapdribisha kripa sandibhivacha patita nam pavane bio vaishnave bio namonamaha jaya shi krishna chaitanya prabhunityananda shi advaita gadadhar shi vasadi gaur bhaktavinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So translation again. This material world resembles the waves of a constantly flowing river. Therefore, what is, what is a curse and what is a favor? What are the heavenly planets and what are the hellish planets? What is actually happiness and what is actually distress? Because the waves flow constantly, none of them has any eternal effect. Can somebody tell this fly to go away? Yeah, no, we don't want. I don't want to use this. No. All right, look, it went away. Okay, good. Worked. Cause he was around for a while during the singing and I think beginning, but you just got to just ask him to leave and he'll leave. So. Uh, so the, what's being bred up here, it's, it's, it's quite a high level of Krishna consciousness. M- means not really being concerned with external conditions. Uh, t- to not be dis- concerned with external conditions, it's a, it's a very high level. I mean, most people are concerned with external conditions. Uh, but here... In this verse saying, what's the, what's a curse, what's a favor, and what's the heavenly planets, what's the hellish planets, like, oh, what's the difference, you know, like, what's the difference between the heavenly planets and the hellish planets, I mean, <laughs> uh, the difference between happiness and distress. Um, but when one becomes fully Krishna conscious or uh, fully transcendental, then, yeah, there's not really concerns for these things. It's not just like you have the extreme example of Prahlad Maharaj in the seventh canto, which we'll be entering soon, the seventh canto. Just a couple more chapters here in this book. This ends the sixth canto. So in the seventh canto, uh, Prahlad Maharaj shows the example of somebody who's completely transcendental, doesn't it, you know he's being attacked he's they're trying to kill him in so many different ways practically all the ways you could think of they're trying to kill him and he's meditating on krishna very peacefully so he's not disturbed now of course to become like prahlad maharaj in that way that's <laughs> it's practically inconceivable but we can become you could say above the modes of material nature above the waves of material nature. We can become, you could say, un, we undisturbed. Or the particular word is, is dira. So dira means undisturbed in this world, which is not a, it's, it's, it's not a, um, It's not, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. If someone's undisturbed, it's actually very impressive. Wow, how can you be undisturbed in such a disturbing world? Because so many things are disturbing, actually. There's so, mu- there's so much to be disturbed about in this world. There's so many occasions in which our consciousness is, will be tested. You know, how, how disturbed are you? But if one becomes a dira, then, then yeah, they're undisturbed. So it's a, and one becomes a dira or undisturbed person or sober person, not intoxicated by the modes of material nature, by hearing from 
from dhiras or from a sober person. So therefore we're hearing from Srila Prabhupada, we're reading his books, and we're associating with devotees, right? And in this way, we become gradually, we become uh, dhiras and, and become undisturbed. And uh, that is one of the most, you could say, valuable things that, one, that, a, that a person could achieve just for themselves, personally. It's a great gift. Or you could say it's, a, it's one of the things, a gift one could be given, and one of the gra greatest gifts to be undisturbed. Because <laughs> it's such a disturbing place. Uh, and even in early stages of Krishna consciousness, one could feel that. One should be able to feel that freedom from 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 uh, this uh, uh, being disturbed. Just like we have our one devotee used to live here, Sharba, and he was there was a war in Europe, and he happened to be in the particular place, and he was trying to cross enemy lines and this and that, and it's a long story, but. There were people trying to, threatening to kill him. There's someone who actually tried to kill him. They shot a bullet. And it, it hit his backpack and, you know, shot off and almost hit the other soldier, you know. And all of this, throughout all of this, there's a, he, he wrote up, a, I think it's in Vijay Prabhu's book, actually. He wrote up a whole story of his particular story. And... Uh, of course, while he was being threatened, his life was being threatened, he would tell the guy, oh, I don't think this is a very good idea. You know, this won't be karmically good for you. you know? And uh, you know, the people were like, oh, what's up with this guy? You know, most people are like scared and, you know, and falling on the ground, please, you know, don't. But he's just like very strong and, you know, hey, this isn't a good idea. You know, this isn't going to be good for your future. You know, committing violence. So, anyways, oh no, there's a whole write-up of it, but even in the beginning stage, most people would be very disturbed in that particular situation, but because he was Krishna conscious, because he was feeling Krishna's mercy, he wasn't disturbed. Um, so, so that's the idea. And here, Srila Prabhupada quotes a song uh, by Bhaktivinoda Thakur, My dear living entities within this material world, why are you being carried away by the waves of the modes of material nature? So, he's saying that, okay, these waves of material nature are, be, are carrying us away this way and that way. Which means we're entangled in this, in this, whole cycle of of uh, this whole cycle I was wondering where you were Paul all right there you are I was going to ask I was going to ask where's Paul there you are Paul so this whole cycle of um, engaging in unbeneficial activities means self-destructive activities it's very common nowadays. Most people engage in self-destructive activities. Whether they know it or not, that's another thing. But most people are engaging in self-destructive activities or thoughts, right? One is you start to control the activities, right? Oh, I'm not engaging in self-destructive self activities anymore. Okay, very good. But then there's a whole mental world, right? What type of self-destructive thoughts are we having? So, uh, and this is all, you could say, due to being in the waves of material nature, right? To be focusing on, or to be absorbed in material, material, material. We were talking last night, we talking, I was telling uh, our bark to Kevin, we have a few Kevins actually, but. He comes to the lounge, but anyways, I was saying, because he, he was asking about japa, right, chanting Hare Krishna, some, he said that his mind is always wandering, like he's chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Did I get enough gas in the car? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Krishna. Um, 
what's up with my mom nowadays? You know, I wonder what she's up to. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. What am I going to have for breakfast? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And what else was he saying? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Oh, I got to get my tire fixed at the tire shop. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So he's saying, like, he's having that experience, just a lot of, like, you know, going all over the place. Um, so I was saying, well, you keep on chanting, and over time, it you know, becomes less. The amount of the gaps where your, your mind's wandering becomes less. And I was saying maybe you could increase the volume of your voice. It overpowers your thoughts, your mind. That's the, that's the wonderful nature of kirtan, right? And then to read about japa, for example, because it is a science, there's a lot to it, actually. To read about it, to talk about it, to listen to lectures about it, how to, how to chant properly, make advancement in chanting. Um, so I was saying these different things. And then I was saying to read some type of scripture at night. And then in the morning, um, it will help with the chanting. And also, even before chanting, sometimes devotees read prayers. They read prayers before they chant their japa, or they read a chapter of Bhagavad Gita before they chant their japa. And in this way, that like propels one into chanting uh, nicely. Just like in deity worship, the standard is you actually chant all types of different prayers before... Um, before you actually engage in the worship. Because the idea is it's, it's, it's preparing your mind. Not that you just roll out of bed and you just start worshiping the deity. There's bathing, which is, which is supposed to be in a Krishna conscious way. It means chanting mantras and you know cold water and it's a whole. And then there's putting on tilak, chanting different mantras and putting on fresh, clean clothes. And then there's coming down and offering respects to the spiritual master and to the deities and to the devotees. And then before you do the worship, there's all these prayers reminding you who you are. I'm a servant of Krishna. This is my great good fortune. This isn't a chore. <laughs> it doesn't say that, but you know the, the, the implication is that, that this is my great good fortune. I'm engaged in this worship. And the idea is it's, you're purifying the conscience before you engage in the worship. So there's a preparation. So similarly with japa, you could see it like that. There could be some preparation. The night before, what are we doing? What time we go to sleep? The morning, how we approach japa, right? And then there's a lot more to it. So, so yeah, the... Uh, So being carried away by the modes of material nature um, to be uh, engaged in these self-destructive habits and like I was just saying with the mental. mental. Now of course one could be thinking of sinful things while they're chanting to, trying to chant Hare Krishna. Uh, and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur when talking about this because sometimes sinful remembrances will come into one's mind while chanting. That's there, maybe, <laughs> hopefully not. But one thing about that is that those bad impressions or some scars that, that a person may have, they need to be replaced with good ones. Therefore, the beauty of Krishna, spending time in Krishna consciousness is that there are some good impressions being made. Just like Rathiatra, we just had Rathiatra in Los Angeles. It was a, it was a, it was a, it was a transcendental impression made on our mind, right? Seeing Lord Jagannath chanting Hare Krishna, right? Serving prasadam to people. It's a. So when we chant, hopefully that will come, <laughs> right, in our minds. But Bhakti Siddhanta Saras, and then there's sinful desires. Okay, sinful desires that come into the mind while chanting. That may happen also. So, oh, the fly came back. All right, leave, please, leave me. So, he said that if one, one should not give up chanting 
or one's sincerity or seriousness in chanting if one faces those things, but one should continue and know that this will go away over time. Um, and uh, so that's, this is one of the things he was, was saying. So to be above the modes means to not engage in self-destructive activities. And by the way, mode of goodness could also be self-destructive in a sense that it's not, it's not, we're cheating ourselves of not, you know, being Krishna conscious or just whatever, enjoying the mode of goodness. So that's one thing. And, and if the living entity tries to understand that he's the eternal servant of Krishna, there will no longer be any misery for him. So anyways, that's what I was saying, material, material. So we have material, material in our minds. So I was telling this devotee, we have to get spiritual material in our minds. Spiritual material means spiritual subject matters. It's just spiritual material. <laughs> anyways, I thought it was amusing, but. Uh, so if we understand we're eternal servant of Krishna, then there's no more misery. But without understanding that, uh, Krishna wants us to give up all engagements and surrender to him. If we do so, then there's no, um, there's no material misery. Or else it's just like being thrown into a mine of salt, as Vishnu Chagrita Tucker says. Thrown into a mine of salt, that's all you experience is salt, right? Or just like when you, when somebody's cutting onions, I know no one does that here, but when one is cutting onions, it's just, it really, you know, you're crying and the, the, the smell of the onions, it's just a really intense thing. Or like when you drive through, not Watsonville, but what's that place up there in North California where they have a bunch of onions? Or no, I was saying it's garlic. Gilroy. Gilroy. Garlic, is it? And onions. And onions. Yeah, garlic. So when you drive through that town, I drove through that town recently because you, you drive through the town because you go to Bay Area. When you drive through there, all you could all you could experience and smell, or at least all you could smell, is just garlic. You know, literally when you drive through there, just garlic. And they have these garlic fests, actually, like a festival where they make garlic ice cream and garlic beer and all this stuff, whatever it is. You know, you you th you, th you think that you, they would be sick of garlic, you know living in that town. But not only did they're surrounded by garlic, but they actually have a garlic fest. So I guess I guess maybe people they grow up and they take all the they kinda of grow up with that garlic smell and they like it. Or I guess people who move there <laughs> they go there for the garlic I don't know. And they have a garlic fest. Like in Santa Barbara they have avocado fest. There's a lot of avocados up there. Or like you drive sorry but for example, but you drive through the town and it there's a my mother told me she, she was about to marry this guy before she married my father. <laughs> it didn't work out, but anyways, the guy grew up in a town, Midwest or whatever, and they went back there to check out the town. And uh, the whole town, she said, just smelled very awful. And you know why? Want to take a guess? Slaughterhouse. Yeah, slaughterhouse. Old town smelled awful. And then my mother, when she got there, she said, this is terrible, she told him. This is terrible, like, and they were thinking about moving back there, you know, to get married and move back there. My mother was like, I can't live here, you know. This is, um, I can't live here. This is, first of all, it's boring. I'm coming from San Diego. It's a very boring place. But aside from being boring, it just it smells terrible. Then he said, hey, you, know, you get used to it, you know, kind of get used to it. So, so whether it's a salt mine or a garlic place or the, one of these towns, it's the, the people's experience is like, that's what they experience, you know. So similarly, what's being mentioned here is that people in the material world is just full of miseries. And if somebody doesn't understand that, one, it means 
they're not seen. When it, when it means there's, there's a bit of illusion going on there that they can't see the misery in the world. Or, or two is that one is they're in maya or an illusion they can't see. Or they're in yoga maya because yoga maya means, okay, they, if a person comes to a particular level of Krishna consciousness, they don't see the place as full of misery, but they see it as Vishram Purna Sukhayate, they see it as full of happiness. Right? Um, so there is misery, but it, he's saying that if we surrender to Krishna, then this uh, temporary happiness of this world is also misery, but in ignorance we can understand this. That's like the mode of ignorance. People think, I'm enjoying, right? Like living in that, like one of those towns. I think, oh, very good, you know, specifically the slaughterhouse town. Oh, very good, you know, this is. And, and they may work at the factory and they think, I'm enjoying life. You know, I got a big ranch and I, got a, I work at the slaughterhouse and I, I live in this smelly town. And, you know, I got my family and, and we're enjoying, right? But it's, it's illusion. One thinks they're enjoying, but it's a mode of ignorance. Uh, but then Prabhupada says, when one comes to his senses, when he becomes Krishna conscious, he is no longer concerned with the various conditions of this material world. He is not concerned with happiness or distress, curses or favors or heavenly or hellish planets. He sees no distinction between them. So we see the example of Prabhupada that he, that he wasn't concerned with happiness or distress or curses or favors or different heavenly or hellish planets. He was just, he was surrendered to the order of his guru and he was concerned with, with fulfilling that order. That's all, that was his only concern. Which, of course, within that order, there's many different aspects, but you could say he was, fulfill, he was trying to fulfill that order. He did surrender to that particular order. So that's the idea. That's how we could practically apply this. We, don't, we shouldn't think that we become like Prahlad Maharaj in the way that we'll see in the seventh canto, him being undisturbed in all of these particular cases at the very high level. But, in, but how we could become undisturbed is that, or not concerned with these material conditions, is that we have say Atma Kabut here, A.K. Kudananda, that our intelligence should be one-pointed, trying to spread Krishna conscious, be Krishna conscious, and then not many branched, like those not on this path, many branched. So it's like one-pointed. So it means that we'll be able to deal with all the different material conditions because we're, we have one-pointed intelligence. That's how we could see it. All right, does anybody have any uh, question or comment? We have a mic for Javita Prabhu. You want to pass that mic, Bach to mic, it's right above you, Ash. Eight twenty-two now. So just one uh, little enhancement on that story about Sharaba, yeah. which is quite dramatic and uh, inspiring. Anyone who hasn't read it or heard it lately, um, he. I'm not going to tell the whole story, but he. Uh, it was quite r remarkable, and that he he was I think Serbian had to go to go to Croatia because there were no temples in Serbia. He had read the Bhagavad Gita. He was inspired. But he wanted to get a temple, and the nearest temple was in Croatia, so he had to go. Meanwhile, it's the war, the early 90s. There was this war there in former Yugoslavia, and it was very dangerous. People, you can't go, you can't go. There's a war going on, so I'm going. And he was inspired by this, this little motto that we can all learn. Um, let's see if I get it right. <laughs> is it Mare Krishna Rake K? Rake Krishna Mare K? Is that the right order? So Mare Krishna, if Krishna wants to kill you, no one can protect you. You saw that with the Ranyakashipu and all these demons, you know. But Rage Krishna Marike, if Krishna wants to protect you, then no one can kill you. So just to tell the story, he, he mentioned that they tried to kill him. So he's, he, he gets uh, stopped by the, uh, I think the Serbian uh, soldiers. And uh, 
he doesn't have proper identification. You know, he's he's shaved up, and this, and and he's you know looking like a devotee. But the picture that he had on his on his identification was without that. It didn't look like him. You know, so that was a, a problem. So anyway, they decided that you know the default was to just execute you. So they said, okay, lay on the fl on the ground, you know, face face down, and he had his backpack on the back. And uh, by the way, I, I met him in Washington when I went, and he gave me some enhancements on this story that I didn't want in the book. And so uh, he's, he, he's, he's chanting, and he, and he stopped chanting. And then he, he said, then he remembered how important it was to remember Krishna at the time of death, so he started chanting again. And they shot point blank with a rifle at his back, but he had the backpack. But then in the backpack, he insisted there was nothing hard in there, there was just some clothes. But somehow or other, it, it ricocheted, as, as Balaram had mentioned, ricocheted off and then went right past the ear of another soldier. So those guys started arguing, you almost killed me, you know, this whole thing going on. So they, they, uh, they, they gave up the idea of executing him, and then they were going to, they questioned him, you know, they interrogated, you know. And he gave all of these, you know, who he was and, and, and his names back, back in that he, they could call and so forth. So after that, they were kind of satisfied, but one guy wasn't satisfied because one of the names he gave sounded like a Serbian name. So this individual guy, and this was a, this was a camp of like assassins. They would go out at night with knives and kill people and come back, you know. So he, he was in a cell, and the guy came and, and said, okay, I want that, you, you know, you're, you're obviously a, a part of the enemy, you know, so I'm going to kill you. So Sarabi Sar had some pictures of Krishna, so I forget which one he showed him, but a nice painting, you know. And he showed him the picture, because these guys are all religious, supposedly, Christians, you know. And he said, and, and Sharp said, this is God. And, and to him it looked like a lady, you know, so many paintings of Krishna, you know. He says, oh, she's so beautiful. And so it, it completely disarmed him, and he gave up the idea of killing him, you know. <laughs> and it was one thing after another like that. Um, the, the, the miraculous ways in which he was saved. And eventually, he was able to get to Croatia, join the temple. And then there's a whole story about it, how he eventually came to L.A., became a Bajari. And now he's situated in uh, Washington, D.C. as a Bajari. He got COVID. He survived that. And he, he wrote to me. So it's a very inspiring story. It's like one of these miraculous stories that's faith building. He says, oh, Krishna really does protect you, you know. Because he was chanting constantly. He was, this whole time, he just stopped, he didn't stop chanting. So. Nice. Yeah, he was. He lived here for a number of years. When I joined the temple, he was living here because he was he was Tirtha Maharaj's uh, bhakta leader actually in Croatia, uh, Sharba. So he was there when Tirtha Maharaj or Mahatattva joined, and then Mahatattva was down here as the temple president, and then Sharba came down from L.A. and he was living here for some years. So. And then he kind of traveled here and there, Hawaii, and then he was in D.C. for many years. So. And uh, I was thinking about, because if Krishna wants to protect you, no one could kill you. Krishna wants to kill you, no one protect you. So devotees have faith in Krishna, right? He'll protect me. But, you know, we should try to do our part, you know, not try to go on a limb too much. You know, oh, Krishna will protect me, right? Like I was, Sureshwar, he was up on the ladder yesterday and he was going up on the roof practically of the Krishna lounge by the sign. And I said, Sureshwar, what's going on? And he said, oh, Krishna will protect me. And then I told Paul that, that Sureshwar is forcing Krishna pr to protect him. <laughs> but he didn't listen, he kept on going, so... All right, are there any other, uh, yes? That kind of reminded me of Pariksha Maharaj when he, he could ask for some benedictions, but he didn't. But my question was, um, what, what would be better, I, I know the answer, but what would be better if, um, Somebody who is completely not disturbed, but not Krishna consciousness, or a devotee 
in the waves of material nature that is Krishna consciousness. Somebody like a the devotee who is disturbed, but is actually Krishna consciousness, like trying to think of Krishna. A non devotee that's disturbed? A non devotee that is not disturbed. Undisturbed? Yeah. 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 Like, then, like uh, let's say he's like trying to be satisfied if he's. And then a devotee who is in the modes? Yeah. Which one's better? Well, tell us. Non devotees better? No, it's, 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 I mean, how, how is a non devotee going to be, even if you say, oh, he's very peaceful and this and that, but, but, I mean, they, their, their particular peace, you could say, or their particular, or he's very compassionate, right? So he's such a compassionate non-devotee. He sponsors, he sponsors 5,000 chickens every, every Christmas. He's such a compassionate devotee, you know. He never raises his voice, you know, to anybody. Or, but if he's just, a, you know, compassionate, under the wrong conception, then he's not really compassionate. Or if we could say, "Oh, he's very peaceful," you know, very peaceful. But that all co- that all co- that also could just we're not really interested in associating with people, you know, because of their good qualities or so-called good qualities. If they're not Krishna conscious, because ultimately, it's you could say those are shadow qualities; they're not like real. So better to associate with a devotee who's in the modes. <laughs> so, and better to associate with a devotee who's not in the modes. That's the best. Or trying to get out of the modes. Because you got the modes, right? And then you got someone who's trying to get out, and you got someone who's out. So, that's, Rupa Goswami says, always asso- you should always associate with more advanced devotees, right? Um, but it is important that devotees do, you could say, manifest good qualities because it helps. One reason it is it, it, one reason it's it's that's a sign that they're being Krishna conscious. But another reason is that just to give faith to people. I mean, it's a good. We're supposed to be building people's faith, not destroying it, or not corroding it, or or. You know, is Krishna conscious? Quite, in other words, if somebody looks at us and our qualities, that should be faith building, and that should be uh, that should be a demonstration of the power of Krishna consciousness. Not that they look at us and like, oh, not that they look at us and this, and they start to question Krishna consciousness. Oh, does it really work? So it's important to develop those, and if we become Krishna conscious, and automatically those develop within one. And out of those 26, as we mentioned some time ago, the most important is, right, surrender to Krishna, because from that all of the, all, all the other ones come. Um, so that's the point, to surrender. All right, any other? I think Jurita probably have a comment or? Okay. What would be an example of being thrown into a mine of salt today? Because we talked about activities and using just a grain of salt, you know, and certain activities that are pleasurable. But what would be a, yeah, what, what would I have to do to be thrown into a mine of salt? A mine of salt. What do you have to do? What would somebody, yeah, what would be the mad elephant Are you talking about like, like, like in a, in a, in a, in a like a, like analogy of the mine of salt, or like a literal literal mine of salt. <laughs> a literal. Yeah. Well, you'll have to go to a mine of salt <laughs> and jump in.
Mahatap Bhu Bhaktinanda Tirtha Maharaj, he was only, he had a very good graphic sense. He was always concerned that the, that the curtains matched the color and everything. And he told us that these, these pillar type things here, that if they're obscured like this, whoops, you have a so you hang it up here, but if you leave it like that, then it, it, it sits, if you could just push it there, it has this as a regular thing, and this has to walk around to it. And it's, uh, then it, it kind of adds another uh, element to the uh, whole design of the place. So if you just hang it in front, it's not the end of the world, but it shows that it, you know, it, it, it does help. So try to conscious of that. Uh, hanging a bead bag up on the wall. And we got these nice little hooks that we wouldn't put up for that purpose. Or you could just put it around your neck. <laughs> or you could just not chant, yeah. Just joking. All right, any last online? You there? Anyone? No one's there? Okay. I'm sure somebody's there with it. Just. <laughs> All right, Grinchad Shimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.